All right, I think I'm live with a mic, and it looks like it's close enough to time. Um, thank you for staying this long. Uh, <laughs> talk. Um, we're here to talk about software supply chain security. My name is Michael Windsor. Uh, I am a co-founder of a project called Alpha Omega, and this is Winowar. You should introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Munar Afiz. I'm the CEO of Open Refactory. And we're going to talk today about an approach to scaled security across open source and dealing with lots of dependencies and how you can actually start to make progress in a way that sometimes feels overwhelming. Um, and I'm going to go down. Um, so that's us. <clears throat> so every supply chain talk has to have this obligatory slide, but I'm teeing up a joke in a minute or two, so we'll get to that. <clears throat> so Alpha Omega is a project that was uh, founded uh, and is by Microsoft and Google, and now Amazon has joined the party as well, and essentially is a fund that directs uh, money towards open source security. Our, and our mission is to catalyze change, so we're not here to just keep paying for all the security problems to the end of time, but trying to provoke and catalyze change across entire ecosystems. If you think about the alpha as being highly leveraged points of contact where we're working with uh, package management systems, language tools, and things that have dramatic effect over lots of developers. And Omega is an effort to try and figure out how do we solve the problem for the hundreds of thousands or even millions of open source projects that are not going to be directly influenceable and just, you know, still represent an awful lot of technical debt that needs to be addressed. Our strategy comes down to investing in four different categories. Category A is staffing engagements where we provide uh, funding for organizations to have a security engineer in residence who actually starts to change the culture of that organization to make things more secure and move them towards security. Category B, which often overlaps with A, is around package repositories because they are such critical points of just influence over supply chain security. It's how people get their supply chain in most cases. In many ways, the app, these, these package repositories are the app stores of software development, but without any of the protections that people come to expect or not enough. Category C are for audits and remediation. These are specific projects where we go off and do work to make things better. Uh, audits also are a great way for us to start engaging with an organization that we've never worked with before because how an organization responds to an audit uh, typically tells you where they are in their journey of security. And then category D are for innovation and experiments where we're trying to do new things and figure out what we don't know. And there's a lot that we don't know and the industry as a whole is still learning how to solve these problems. Uh, our engagements so far have been pretty widespread. These are various entities that we have worked with. Um, and I won't go much more into that slide. You should know most of these slides, people. Um, historically, we've only been around since 2022. Uh, and we've spent a fair amount of money and done a lot of work so far. Most of the really high impact work has actually been with other people in other organizations. And their work has followed on to what we're doing. That's really how we have optimized our approach. So our early experiments in trying to solve at scale, partnering with organizations like Open Refactory, so sent them out into the wild and say, go, go scan a lot of projects and find vulnerabilities and fix those vulnerabilities, and then send PRs to, to projects. And even when they were able to sort of get over the hump of being an automated or scaled approach and the projects sort of actually accepting their vulnerability reports and so forth, the result was like they went out and they came back and they said, we did all this work, and it was clearly good work, but we didn't know how to tell anybody about the world being better. And metaphorically, and it took a while to figure this out, it was like coming back with a barge filled with garbage, but there was still a giant Pacific garbage patch. And so the problem is just, how do we turn this into useful outcomes? How can we do work that can't necessarily solve all the problems, but can allow somebody to be able to reduce their risk or manage their risk in a better way? Um, it took me a long time, by the way, to get a license free rendition of Austria for scale. But instead of the banana for scale, we went for Austria for scale today. So that's good. So the problem gets even harder when you realize that that one critical project in Nebraska, wait, laser pointer, I missed it. Totally missed it, there we go. Um, is itself its own pile of complexity. Uh, and this is a 2001 uh, Space Odyssey reference. He's looking at all the stars in the distance like that. And so as we start to look into these projects, you find that you keep going down and they have all these dependencies. And that graph of dependencies that you think about is actually much more complicated and therefore less actionable than you'd like as well. And so there's some interesting challenges that came from that. <clears throat> uh, 
almost every organization that consumes open source uh, does so as if it came down from the sky on the back of a unicorn with <coughs> rainbows from every port. That is unfortunately true for corporations, but it is even more unfortunately true for open source projects. Individual open source projects might worry about their own hygiene and like that, but they assume that everything else they're consuming is just great, when in fact, across many dimensions, it is probably not. Uh, so every organization has to look at their dependency graph and start thinking about what are you doing to either fix it, fork it, whether it's a hard fork or a downstream fork or whatever, or forgo it, to stop using it. Because those are actually your only choices. If you don't engage with your supply chain, you're, you're, you're vulnerable. And this is sort of, you know, obviously a product of the XZ conversation, but it's certainly not the only example of this. There's one more F, which is funding. And what Alpha Omega has learned is it's actually much harder to fund things than you think. It's not like you can just show up to a project and say, here's $50,000, go fix all the problems, right? And know that it's gonna be well spent. <clears throat> Um, I'm now going to tee up and hand over to Open Refactory, where they're going to talk about what we did specifically in a project with um, Airflow, where we talked about Airflow as a section of the beach that we could clear. So rather than doing the garbage patch, we were able to say, let's go to Airflow. And we have 719 dependencies. What can we do to make that specific area, not the whole part garbage patch, but just Airflow, be a safer, more secure place? And so with that, I'll hand over to you. <coughs> press the down button. Yeah. So thank you, Michael. Um, so first, let this sink on you. Most of the code that you have is not yours. And, but you're taking all the risk. And we have spent such a, a lot of time just looking at the proprietary code that we write and try to secure that. But that's, and we even struggle at that because there's like our own code and we're not able to make that secure with all the efforts that we put. Now think of tens of thousands of open source code that we just consumed. Each of them has a marker on its back and each of them can bite you. So that's the scary bit that we all have to look at, but we still aspire to build a world of software that we, can, we all can trust. So what Open Refactory is doing is we are investing on, uh, so we are a static analysis tool company where we are building better static analysis tools that then can be used to find uh, security, reliability, safety, and compliance bugs in your proprietary code, and most importantly, in your supply chain dependencies at scale so that we can build or go towards that desirable future. So this is your supply chain dependency. It's just a diagram that, that shows basically that we are at just consuming your proprietary artifact is at the tip of the iceberg. And a whole lot of that is underneath that. So the current approach dealing with that supply chain dependencies is something called software composition analysis. And what software composition analysis does is just a matchmaking. It looks into all of your dependencies. It finds out, it has this database of all the CVEs that have been out there. And it just does a matchmaking like you are using library foo version 1.2. There is a version, there is a CV that's associated with that. You have to deal with that. And that's that's very much important advice because on 10th of December 2021, everybody wanted that information. Am I using log4shell? Uh, log4j? Because suddenly this vulnerability came out. All of these engineer managers, security people, everywhere in, in these organizations started asking that question. So having these tools is great. And it helps us deal with the incident response and when bad things happen. But the problem is that what this tool does or when it notifies you, the damage has already happened. The clock has started. Your code is vulnerable. You have to do something about it. And, and it's a race against time. So this is where the SCAR tools or software composition analysis tools, they pick up the signal and they tell you. This is when a CV is issued. But there's things that has happened before in that timeline. 
Some time ago, the bug was discovered. It was reported to the maintainers. And then the maintainer fi hopefully fixed the bug. It doesn't happen all the time. And then the CV is issued. Your clock starts there. But there's, this timeline is even longer than that. The bugs were actually introduced much earlier than, than this. In the case of log 4 shell, the actual the problem, the root cause of that, has been in the code for eight years. The longest that I have found was, in, uh, was a vulnerability in Windows Pooler uh, service that has been there for 24 years. So things are there. The, these uh, garbage patches, uh, or uh, the, the specific garbage patch, and all of these problems, they're all latent. This time between bug discovered and CVE issued, industry data says that that's about 120 days. That's a lot of time. Like, even after a bug has been, uh, has been discovered. That time the bugs in introduced is years. So how, what if we look at, so our approach and the way we were looking at this when we started this experimentation a year ago is what if we have an approach where we proactively look for bugs in a large number of artifacts using static analysis tools and then report them to the work with the maintainers report them to the uh, report these bugs to them and then work with them to fix those bugs some of these bugs may become vulnerabilities in uh, as as they have been and when they become vulnerabilities, the software composition analysis tools pick up the signals. But if they don't become vulnerabilities, that's still okay. Uh, we still have bug-free code that has been improved, uh, improved a lot. So this catches up a, w a very different signal than, than what CVE catches up. These are ahead of time information that is then made available to the maintainers and we work with them. And that's the garbage patch, as Michael was mentioning, that we collected. What this does is it, it gives maintainers more, uh, the end users, more time to react to the bugs or vulnerabilities if they are also aware of this information. So what we are looking for is improving the software composition analysis. We are here in terms of the timeline. How can we move over there? I don't want to use the term shift left. It has just been so much abused. But so just move over into the timeline. And, 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 and just get better intel. Well, and so, no, if I, if I yes. may, like the way the vul most vulnerabilities are discovered today is through security audits and manual processes that don't scale very well. And even with automated fuzzing techniques that requires people to invest it in the fuzzers and so forth like that, this is hopefully making it possible for us to start proactively finding vulnerabilities or even potential ones much, much earlier in the, in the process. Uh, at a scale that is, is manageable. So. Yeah, so we're looking at a software composition analysis plus yeah. plus, and one of the signals that we are adding is identifying and addressing the vulnerabilities or bugs before they manifest and find them proactively. So what does this do for, for us, for the end users? I mentioned about better incident response. So previously, as I mentioned, your clock started here and you were having a race against time. Now you'll have more time to react to a particular, uh, to, a, to a potential bug and go through that fix for, fork or forego process and so on. Yes. Sorry, I have a follow-up question on this. So you said that you know, most of the bugs won't become vulnerabilities and then we also- Some, some of them. Yeah. And yes. then, yeah, some of them will become vulnerabilities. And then there is another thing about reachability analysis. Uh, from some of the vulnerabilities, you know, there would be few of them that are actually reachable. Yes. So, I mean, as an organization, uh, should I worry about the the vulnerabilities that are reachable, you know, that, that, that should be highly prioritized, that are serious, that are reachable from my code base, rather than focusing my time on the on all the bugs that are there, yes. which might or might not become vulnerabilities and they might not be reachable from my code base and they might not be... That's a great... I, I'm, so I'm going to repeat yes. the question for the video, which is, at the end of the day, should I be worrying about all the vulnerabilities that are in my supply chain or should I focus on the ones that are reachable? I would, I would also rephrase it. Should I be worried about all the bugs? All because the bugs. It is starting from there that should I be worried about all the bugs that are there because I've, I'm, I was an engineer myself and it is it is very hard to write a bug-free code. I mean, every code has bugs, right? And 
but should I be worried about all the bugs that are there? Yeah. And from there, should I be worried about all the vulnerabilities? That you yeah. So How from bugs to vulnerabilities yes. to the ones that actually matter. Yeah. Yeah, I have a good answer to that, but let's hear the whole story. I'll come back to this. And at the end, I'll answer this question first. Um, and you're right, like there's, there's a whole lot of bugs. Industry data says that every 1,000 lines of code that we write, we introduce about 70 bugs. And even after all of the efforts that we have put, there's about 15 bugs that end up in every 1,000 lines of code that end up in production code. So there, there is a whole lot of that. But if it's in my dependencies, whether I'm worried about that or not. Uh, we'll, we'll come to that after I show the data that, that we have uh, collected with this information, and that will help me answer the, uh, answer the question. Okay, so the second thing that we improve is the security posture by having this information earlier. So think of this as the releases that happened after that bug was introduced, and, and some end user were using this vulnerable or some questionable dependencies, and all the releases that were made were problematic. <laughs> so now with this information available from here, you will be able to fix the vulnerabilities from, from this particular, uh, particular point of time. But with this information available earlier, you can do a whole lot of uh, other fixes. I don't know what happened there, but yeah, that, that's also, uh, that should be green too. I, probably I marked up with the presentation. Uh, in some way. But anyway, the, the, the bottom line is that you will have, uh, you'll have, so th think of all of those dependent, so this, this time, the four, hour, four months here and the years before that, all the software that has been released that is, has been dependent on that vulnerable code. That's exponential impact of that vulnerability. And so that needs to be addressed as well. Finally, we worry also about code provenance, where our code is coming from, having this information available, and then using that for some, creating some sort of trust in how we are building our code and how we are, uh, how we are building our code, that creates uh, or improvement of the security posture of, uh, for the end users. So in our case, what we are doing is, for all the analysis that we are pro creating, we are creating an in toto attestation to describe that the artifact that we have scanned that has been uh, uh, and, and identified, uh, it, we look for about 55 different C, uh, CWEs in that particular artifact, and we have found two of them, or we have not found any of them. So that's uh, an attestation that we, have, uh, we are creating we are providing it into public uh, databases, and we are now working with different entities to, uh, to basically figure out how this attestation can be used in, uh, in a code provenance scenario where this can be part of the build, uh, build process and then provide some sort of uh, guarantee that, that the, the dependencies that we are using in order to produce a build, it has been scanned and it has been free of certain kinds of vulnerabilities. So this is what well, uh, the, the way uh, uh, all of this big vision, we are bringing all of this together under Project Clean Beach. So what Project Clean Beach does is it works with the enterprises and we get ownership of the dependencies from enterprises as or organizations as input. We provide a multi-factor risk assessment just like software composition analysis does but we, have, we provide exclusive signals that nobody else does, which is bugs, uh, uh, these unknown bugs that we mentioned uh, that is in your dependencies and that needs to be addressed. We're doing risk mitigation in two fronts. Uh, We're working with the organization that is supporting this cleaning the beach process. And we are also working with the maintainers, open source maintainers who are being affected and working with them to find a, uh, find a solution. And this is done persistently because you cannot just do it once. Industry data shows that about 20% of the dependencies churn uh, over a year, over the course of one year on average. So that means that your SBOM now would, be, would not be the same SBOM at the end of the year. And so, so and this information or this, uh, this vigilance of of looking into vulnerabilities in your uh, 
uh, code at scale or your dependencies at scale, it should periodically continue and provide you intel round the clock regarding what is happening. So this is some of the data that we collected They're all based on this, like go out there and find out on, on a lot of repositories. We looked into the top 2000 projects in the PyPI repository recently, and not only the projects, but also their dependencies. Uh, so right now we have covered about 6,500 in total, and we have identified 325 bugs. Uh, there's 140 of them that are security bugs. There's 51 high severity bugs. And of all the bugs that we have reported, about 60% of them have already been fixed. What is also interesting is the rejection rate of the bugs is pretty low. The bugs that have not been fixed, the 40% of them, only about three or 4%, I don't exactly remember the number, three or 4%, they have been rejected as in like, okay, uh, the attack surface is not there or we don't care about this and so on. The others are, are still pending under evaluation, we're working with the maintainers or these are projects which are not necessarily like very active in, in managing. So not all the projects are similar, uh, have similar, uh, activity going on in, in looking at bugs and, and vulnerabilities. And I'm going to com come to that point as well near the end. Manoir, if I may, I think yes. to the question earlier on, if engineers have to go back and look at all the possible bugs in their upstream supply and manually evaluate them and decide whether there's a, you know, a reachability to it, that's obviously a huge amount of work. If the bug is just fixed, if it's a vulnerability discovered and it's just fixed in the source code, you no longer have to worry about yeah, it. It's not your problem. If you are working directly with the maintainer, then that's great. But then, uh, I mean, on the maintainer side, because maintainers are already facing the burn down. Yes. Of work. So uh, when you are working with the maintainers, are you also, you know, working? So, so we engage, we, we engage, we follow their norms, we work with them to create fixes. Uh, so all through the process. And the reason why we are able to scale and, and are I- Are you also helping with the funding of, of those maintainers? I mean, uh, because there are other companies who are doing the same thing, but they are also paying maintainers when uh, with these sort of- things. Yeah, like Tidelift does a similar model, but yeah, we are not Tidelift and, and, that's, and, and that, that's a different model. In this case, what we are doing is we are just working with the maintainers to get these bugs fixed, but there's no funding associated at this, not, not from Open Refactory. Uh, so right now, uh, here's our capability that we can scan. We have been scanning recently about 1,000 packages every month, and this is growing more and more. We are pro uh, creating these attestations that are available from Six Store, and we are right now working on an API feed for ingestion at the other end, where uh, like there, that's going to provide like oh, what we have done and how this, uh, what are the bugs that we have identified, um, and and so on. Uh, and just to the gentleman's question in terms of the funding here. What we're doing from an Alpha Omega perspective is providing funding to do these scans, to create this sort of scalable approach to understanding where risk is in our various supply chains. Um, and there's a separate effort in terms of how do we cause those organizations to have the resources. But you know, this is not a write lots of checks on the people's bank accounts. This is uh, better for us to know, better to have a good signal to noise ratio uh, there's an awful lot of automated scanning that just spams maintainers. That's not what we're trying to do here. And then how we engage through their downstream dependents and organizations that do have a relationship with them and can provide resources becomes a much more interesting part of the problem. Let's keep going. Yeah, and yes. Once you have scanned the packet, can you scan that again and again for each new release? So the, a one -time experience? So the, the question was, once you've scanned a package, do you scan it again and again, or is it a one-time release? So for the same package, we don't do that, but if, if, if there are new releases that are coming in that package, so an artifact is basically a combo of a package and a release. So we are, we are scanning new elements every time we are doing that, because otherwise if we are scanning the same package with the same ICR or same our tool, it does not make any sense, right? We are getting the same results. But if you release a new bug, you Yes. Yes, and that's that's very common. Like there are bugs that are that come in between a few releases and then go away, and then new bugs appear and, and so on. Uh, so the way we are able to do it is uh, because of the static analysis tool that we have built in, that that fuels this thing. This is called intelligent code repair or ICR, and there are three specific capabilities. And the signal to noise ratio is very important here. 
that our goal is to find more critical bugs, find bugs that other tools miss. Bugs like Log4Shell or Hardblick, which our tool has uh, in the past as, as was demonstrated that we were able to find them. Yes, we did not find them before those happened. But the fact is, if you run, for example, ICR on log4j vulnerable version, it will be detecting an LDAP injection, which no other tool is able to do. So that's an important capability that you have good signal. You need to also have very less noise. Noise is, it's gonna kill, it, it kills you even when you're doing your proprietary code scanning. You will go nowhere when you're looking into 10, uh, like a thousand dependencies uh, underneath. So in, uh, ICR is highly precise. Uh, we have seen like on the summit benchmark, uh, which is created by NIST and Department of Homeland Security of the US, we, have, we had like 4% false positive compared to 90% false positive, which is uh, done by the other tools. In real code, we have seen 300 times fewer bugs uh, that have been reported uh, by, I, uh, by ICR compared to the others. And it's not just fewer, reporting fewer bugs and suppressing stuff means that we're not finding valuable stuff, we're finding. So there's a good blending of finding good stuff and suppressing noise that's happening here. And I'll, I'll share some data about this later. Um, and then we are also able to automatically synthesize fixes. So by the time our security triagers see this on, the, on our triage portal, we already have cut down a lot of false positives, and uh, when it hits the, our, uh, hits the triage portal that, that we maintain at our end, uh, for each of these projects, we are probably seeing four or five bugs. And that's, that's why we are able to scale to looking at many of these bugs and, and identifying whether they're good or bad and then reporting and working with the maintainers. One important thing about this is when we're doing audits, there's always this question of trustworthiness. Uh, if an audit is done, are we able to find all the bugs or like what sort of assurance are we getting off that, of that? If we're doing audits at scale, like this many, that question is even more. Because we're doing it very quickly, are we able to collect a lot of the, uh, like are we just missing a lot of bugs? So what we did was we have look, uh, basically created an infrastructure where we will audit our audits as in, so we, for all the audits that we have done in the last one year or so, we are also tracking for those projects if there are new CVEs being issued and those CVEs have any CWE or common weakness enumeration that matches something that, that's within our scope. So our scope is about 50 CWEs, that, 55 CWEs that we look into and we uh, identify bugs and these include uh, the, the most important ones that are out there, like the SQL injections, the cross-site scriptings, there's uh, like concurrency issues, there are null pointer dereference, all the important issues that everybody cares about. Now, what we do is we automatically look into the OSV data and see whether these projects that we have scanned, they have some new CVEs and they, they also match something. So, which means that we did not do that in time. So, we only missed one, uh, one case in the, in the last one year. And we looked into that, we were disappointed, as in why did we miss that? It was a cross-site uh, cross scripting, which we <laughs> detect very well. And what was interesting was this, uh, this project is called AIO HTTP. This is, a, uh, this is a framework by itself, it's a Python framework. And the, the, where it is getting the input from the outside users, that variable is called request, but it's not an HTTP request. So it's not bound to an HTTP request. So our tool is not picking up that that's a potential taint signal. Instead, because it's a framework, it has its own uh, way of stitching together the actual HTTP request to this internal variable called request. And that's why we missed that particular bug. What we did was we went back and improved ICR to be able to pick that up. And at that point, we were able to detect that and not only that, if future libraries that are, uh, future applications that are based on HTTP, uh, on AIO HTTP, that is going to have this particular problem, we'll also be able to pick it up. So there's two important points that is here. One is we are sharing, uh, we are, we created this periodic monitoring process of our own process, and therefore we can create this trustworthiness metric of what we are doing and how good it is, 
over a period of time, or, and, on, and, uh, and we, we do it continuously, we can provide that. And because we have this feedback loop, we can also improve upon our own uh, artifact and improve that and then make sure like we are not missing uh, bugs. So, so making it better uh, uh, in the process as well. The signal to noise ratio is also very important. And because of, we had low false positive, this allows us more time or allows our security engineers actually more time to work with the maintainers. I spoke with, uh, with some, uh, pros uh, some clients before, and I was joking with them that in our case, over, uh, for the 150 something bugs that we have, uh, 120 something security bugs that we have detected, we have also created proof of concept exploit codes for about 30 of them. And I was joking that our security guys were bored enough, even after they're cr cranking 1,000 data or 1,000 packages every month, that they can spend time on creating these, uh, these proof of concept exploits and sharing them with the maintainers. So, so that's, all of this is because of the false positive or the low false positive that I was mentioning, uh, that, that happens in ICR and not necessarily in, in other tools. So here's an example of, for example, running five different tools on Kubernetes, the most important or most prominent Go project that's out there. And we also ran, Kuber, uh, ran this on a, uh, on a known, on a version of, of Kubernetes, which, is, which happened some time ago, but it had a known race condition and a channel blocking bug in that particular one. So the challenge was, can ICR detect that? Or, and, and what about the other tools? And also do that with what kind of false positive? The result that we have seen, it's not, uh, so first of all, like we found the bug, the other tools did not. But what is also interesting is the number of false positives. And if you go across one package to another package to another package, it's roughly similar. And so this column is very important. And, <coughs> and that, that also comes to the noise uh, part of that. So also in this Kubernetes, we identified 15 true positive cases. But then many of them were low, false, uh, low priority issues. So we, we did not bother reporting them. There was no point like wasting everybody's time in low priority stuff. We only reported two bugs and they were fixed uh, in the process. So that comes to the question that you are asking that just finding any bugs, we are not going and reporting that. We are only reporting the important bugs that has been identified because we are focusing on these 55 CWEs and the number of bugs that we are eventually reporting is a very small number. But because we are looking into the high priority CWEs, we feel like these are something that everybody should know, should know about. About the reachability analysis, we are not there yet, but that's something that's in, in our plans. Like later, actually the, the software composition analysis industry, they have riddled with that problem even more. It's more uh, like huge problem there because you are just like looking into these CVEs that have been issued against, so, so when a CV is, is issued, it is issued not against one release, but multiple releases. And so every time you have the CVEs, you have like that CV is, uh, is associated with like 10 different releases and some of them will match with your, so essentially you'll see this, this like all the time you have these reports of, you have to do something and you don't need to, uh, and uh, you'll be just like wasting a lot of time in chasing all of them. What we are doing is by filtering ourselves, we are reporting already a small amount of bugs. So it, I'll, I'll just give some examples of the bugs that we, so for example, this is a, a path manipulation that happened in OpenMSS. Uh, this was the fix that was generated. Uh, this was not automatically generated by us. Uh, but our maintainers work, uh, so our security engineers work with the maintainers to create this fix. Uh, there, this is a sen sensitive data leak in Anaconda. Uh, this one was created automatically. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, and then there are, so this is a cross-site scripting that was reported privately to Red Hat. Uh, this is uh, in one of their OpenShift operators and that got also fixed internally again uh, by them. Uh, this is the, the data race in Kubernetes, one of the data races that I was mentioning. 
this all got fixed. So now let's look back into this case. Like we are, we are not interested about a whole lot of garbage. We are interested about my garbage, my beach. So we we'll work with Apache Airflow recently and not just Apache Airflow, but all 719 dependencies of them. We scanned them, it took about a month. Perfect. We identified 16 bugs. Okay. There were four high severity bugs, five medium severity bugs, and seven low severity bugs that were reported. For clarity, this is the full transitive graph. It is not the top level dependencies, it's their dependencies and their dependencies all the way down. Yes, and it startles to, all the way. And to our knowledge, this has not actually been done before. Most audits tend to be focused on the project itself and maybe a cursory look at their dependencies. This is going turtles all the way down to the full graph. So this is yeah, complete closure across the space. Keep going, Luminaro. Yeah, and for Apache Airflow, it's only those four high severity and maybe the four plus five, nine medium severity bugs. But that's been done <coughs> one time. It's only nine bugs. You track with those dependencies and, and you fix, the, uh, fix those. What came out in this process was Apache Airflow, instead of focusing on the 719 dependencies, they have figured out a metric in order to focus on a small subset, less than 20 of them, for follow-ups and, and so on. So what this does is this gives you a better view of the risk uh, that's coming from your supply chain dependencies. And because we are not overwhelming or drowning with like tons of like low severity, uh, low severity bugs, this makes sense for a particular uh, engagement in this case, Apache Airflow, to consume this data and, and uh, be so happy that uh, we were featured in, a, in the keynote that happened last week uh, in the Airflow Summit uh, this year. So the, the, the four high se severity bugs that we identified, they were weak cryptography issues. They are right now in the process of being reported with PVR. So it, none of them has been reported, but we are finding the mechanism of working with them. So a, a key point here is, and this is to another comment, is that when the initial reports went into these various dependencies from Open Refactory, the organizations maintaining those projects had a fairly typical, oh, you're from outside, or it's a bot, or whatever kind of stuff. When the Apache Airflow community engaged on those exact same reports and said, hi, we're from Apache uh, Airflow and we care about this. The response went from sort of talk to the hand to immediate excitement and engagement. So it wasn't a question of like needing funding. These organizations were very happy to receive these reports because it had a human connection to a relevance that mattered, right? They, I'm repeating myself, but um, anyway, I think that's a really important aspect of how this kind of scaling feels intractable because of the number of people and all the independent projects, and we all hear the stories of people being drowned in noise. But when you apply the technology to scale this and then have that human ownership connection from a project that cares, that has a reputation that you care about, uh, interesting things happen. Michael, you had a question? Uh, Mike? That's a good point. I, I, gonna, we actually reported repeat, all I'm, the bugs. I'm I gonna, mentioned I'm, that Apache Airflow, they were more concerned about the, the four, uh, the, 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 medium, the high and the medium severity bugs. But we reported all the bugs. And actually all the low severity bugs, barring one, I think, have already been fixed in those projects. Yes. So repeating for the tape, the video, attackers will typically chain together low severity issues to create some higher order thing. I think that the balance here, and we've talked about this between overwhelming and, and, and we don't have a relationship. And so I think this is where the Omega side of the problem gets very interesting, right? Should we be leaving vulnerabilities unreported even if they're minor at the expense of 
you know, that risk versus should we be overwhelming maintainers who don't know who we are and don't have a relationship with us, right? And so that balance is one that I don't think anybody has the right answer to. Um, yes, watch this space. I, I like your approach. Yeah. Uh, one more question. We're, we're going to be short on time, so we're going to yeah. keep going. Yep. Uh, so the question was, if developers are interested in having this sort of for them own, their own projects to get this information, is the ICR stuff available or not? I'll, I'll leave the specific source code of that available. I don't think it is. But what we are looking at from an Alpha Omega perspective is how we can you know, help fund and create a space where the data results of these things on an ongoing basis becomes available. So whether you're running the tools yourself or whether the data sets are available, hopefully we get similar outcomes. But it, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And, we're trying to uh, bootstrap an industry where technology and tooling for that kind of scanning becomes more normal. Again, I think we'd watch this space. Yeah, and one of the derivatives that came out uh, of that particular work, and I've, I just skipped a few slides, uh, two, two or three slides uh, that are there. This QR code is totally trustworthy and will not take you to my <laughs> bank account at all. Uh, yeah, so one of the aspects that, uh, that came out is that we need to also look into these human factors. Uh, in uh, in how the project is managed. So there are issues like, uh, sorry, can, can you go back a couple of slides, yeah. that one? Yeah, so there's issues like governance, uh, the life cycle status, the security posture, the history of, of like uh, how many CVs have been there unattended, all of these make an impact. So, and, and then there's also project specific stuff like for an Apache Airflow, how is their relationship with that particular project that also impacts upon the risk. So the risk is not just some metric where we can just like add, add those. We have to look at each of these human factors and then combine them in order to identify that. So here's a plot hey, of- Before you go to the next slide, one of the things we did is they actually did a subjective analysis across all 700 of those combining scorecard scores and then just where it fits in our world and just a relatively experienced airflow person looking at that and saying, hmm, right, or what we know. And there's some gaps, but it immediately produced a heat map of we should look here. Yeah. And then please talk about this. Is yeah, one of the, the other inputs that came to that heat map was looking into like releases across uh, over the course of time which is in the x-axis here, and each of these bubbles, uh, the circles represent that, and how many CWEs, how many CVEs were in that particular release. And so looking into that particular thing, so for example, this is the, that same graph with Apache Airflow that has a whole lot of history. And what is interesting is, isolatedly, that data is interesting because we, we want to approach or towards zero, we want to have a downward slope. These are all desirable aspects. What was also interesting is when we combined this data with the Apache Airflow activity, and they found that by the time they improved upon their security posture in some known ways, which they know from their history, they have seen that particular drop in, in that, uh, like, uh, in the number can, can of CWs. A There's a, a spot right here, unless I'm stealing your slide. Yes. This is when they actually created a security team. So when Airflow said security matters to us, that precipitous drop happened as they got serious and the acceleration of their drop happened because they created a security team. Now there's a lot of, more, there's more data to come from this space. The analysis of like the, going from a stated security posture to an observed security posture and getting, you know, scalable metrics on that space is very interesting and work we want to continue. Yeah, so the bottom line is we also need to have these kind of data available in our risk assessment and management process. And that's how we will improve upon the software composition analysis, which has become very reactive. It has served us well, but it's try, time to improve it with these critical signals that are coming, that, that represent the risk that is coming from the unknown or undetected bugs, as well as the risks that, that are coming from the human factors of how the project is managed and so on. So the first part is the work that has already been done. This is what I have presented in this particular presentation. The next one is in the future. So hopefully next year in Open Source Summit, like in the US or North America, we'll, uh, in Europe, we'll, we'll have some data available 
to to report on on that particular effort. So I want to thank you know, Open Refactory for the work they've been doing with us in Alpha Omega. We've been funding that work towards creating open source good of helping open source projects be more secure, but also playbooks and processes for how any software organization can look at its dependency tree and start to reason about that without having to know and do everything across the space. Um, we'll be available for questions outside after this talk. Thank you, Manoir. Sure. This is great. Thank you very much. Thank Have you a good day. for coming.